Hi, I'm Bob Power, Vice President of Corporate Relations at OTC Markets Group, and welcome to our educational webinar uh, with our with our special guest, Mark Sims, CEO of CMI2I. The topics that will be discussed are corporate governance trends, changing investment behavior, and the rise in activism with institutional investors. Here we have a bio of Mark, and again, Mark, thank you for, for participating in this. Mark was co-founder of Capital Precision and was its CEO until June 2013. And again, Mark presently serves as CEO of CMI2I. Mark, uh, at this point, I'm pleased to uh, forward the presentation to you, and you can go to the next slide and talk about the agenda. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thanks, Bob, for passing over. Um, so, as I said, just as Bob's introduced, um, really the, the topics that we want to talk about today are, amongst other things, sort of rise in shareholder activism and some sort of preparation for that. Uh, we're going to look at some of the regulatory changes that are expected to sort of change the shareholder or investment landscape and also the behavior potentially of shareholders. Um, and looking at sort of current and future trends in terms of how shareholders are looking at the companies that they invest in, and also looking at any other sort of future market drivers around the corner that uh, could have an impact in how an issuer interacts with their existing investor base and also potential investors. So just quickly explaining who we are, for people who are not familiar, we're, we're a capital markets intelligence company based in London. Uh, we work for issuers all around the world, providing both sort of capital markets intelligence and also corporate governance advisory services. About half of what we do is transactional, so this is sort of M&A, spin-offs, delistings, demergers, anything that's going to have an impact on the shareholder base and subsequently require sort of votes from shareholders. And the other half of the work we do is more financial calendar related, where we work for about 120 issuers around the world, helping them really understand who's owning them, i.e. moving in and out of their equities and or their debt, and how those shareholders behave. So more specifically, what we want to talk about today is the, the survey that we conduct each year that looks at corporate governance trends and the sort of key issues for institutional investors in terms of how uh, they are going to monitor and look at the companies that they invest in. So the, the survey itself was conducted at the back end of 2015 and published at the sort of back end of the year, beginning of this year. And what it's taking is a forward look at what the institutional investors think are going to be the key corporate governance issues during the next 12 months, i.e. going into the proxy season. We sent the surveys out to institutions worldwide, and the, the respondents came from uh, institutions representing $10.5 trillion of assets under management. So a lot of these are the very big institutions, sort of black rocks of this world, that actually contribute to the survey. So looking at the, the survey highlights, there's no surprise to anyone, but uh, you know the key things that were was sort of said were going to be the issues would still be remuneration and board elections, um, and you'll find that these have been the key issues for a number of years now. Um, but looking at some of the other highlights, 58% of the investors obviously saying they do, they think that investors are not providing sufficient information on such subjects as risk management policy and internal controls. Um, We'll look at risk in a little bit more detail further on, but half of the investors say that, uh, that they don't feel that companies have a sort of relevant risk measures in place to deal with things like cybersecurity. 61% of investors expect engagement to increase with shareholders going forward, uh, uh, sorry, with the companies they invest in going forward. And interestingly this year, 94% of respondents have stated that they are so actively approached by other investors in issuers ahead of corporate governance meetings, so uh, or shareholder meetings. So the, this is a far more in, uh, communication between the companies, which is really sort of being driven by how they interact through networks like ICGN, etc. 
So looking at shareholder engagement in a little bit more detail, one of the things that uh, became sort of fairly evident is there's quite a disconnect between what the companies think the institutional investors want to hear and what the institutional investors are saying they want to talk about. Bear in mind, this survey was directed at the heads of corporate governance at the institutions, not at the portfolio managers. So as you can see from the left-hand side, there is a, you know, a, an obvious correlation between what the companies want to talk about in terms of executive compensation, and, and so do the shareholders to themselves. But if you look across to the right, you start seeing the delta increase and the sort of disconnect between actually what the institutions want to hear and what the company is putting forward. And the one in the middle I think is quite interesting to, to look at because it's talking about strategy. Now, this is, bear in mind, conversations being held with the head of corporate governance at the institution, not at the portfolio manager, but they are wanting to talk about the company's strategy um, because really what we're getting as feedback from the institutions is that their version of sustainability is the long-term sustainability of the investment proposition and how that's delivered. So corporate governance heads are wanting to talk about topics that may traditionally have been directed by the IR team to the portfolio manager but now need to be communicated to this new touch point in the institution itself. And on the far right you've got sort of a big disconnect between board composition and, and sort of board policies. So this is looking at board tenure, overboarding, and other sort of subjects like that. But then also risk management. You know, and it's sort of quite clear that a lot of the institution investors feel that there isn't enough risk management in place from the companies to deal with any number of scenarios. So if we're looking at that in, in more detail, as you can see here, that uh, the statistic I mentioned earlier, that sort of 59% of investors do not think that uh, issuers are providing sufficient disclosure on their risk management policy and have internal controls in place, um, and that sort of 50% of them do not have uh, policies in place for cybersecurity specifically. Well, I spoke to one of the big institutional investors, and he sort of capsulated this by saying that you know, 90% of companies say they have sustainability and uh, sort of call, uh, policies in place for risk management, but actually when they look at it, only 60% actually have a, a firm strategy and only 25% have developed a business case for it. So everybody's sort of saying they have policy in place, but actually it's not being accepted as being universally implemented by the institutional investors. So looking at shareholder cooperation, I think one of the surprises of the survey this year for us was just how much investors are talking to other investors. And as you can see, 94% are saying that they are engaging with other investors ahead of shareholder meetings. Now that is a big jump and really we looked at uh, asking the question as how they are getting to communicate and it's through networks like the ICGN, the International Cooperative Governance Network, and because they're becoming a lot more engaged in how they sort of uh, talk to other shareholders as a result of obligations that they have as shareholders to, to the various sort of codes and directives out there. And as you can see on the right hand side, there's an expectation that the, the engagement will increase also with the issuers themselves. So looking at what just driving this, we, we was really trying to get a, a, an idea of what has been sort of motivating the institutions to get more engaged. And I think, you know, the general view is that um, the rise of stewardship codes across the, the world, I and mean, there's 12 sort of different active stewardship codes, the most recent one being enacted by Malaysia, um, which is really sort of giving the in, for institution investor more of a sort of duty to to be responsible as the owner for that company. So as you can see from the UK Stewardship Code, which was sort of revamped uh, back in 2012, that you know one of the things they're required to do at Point Through is, is monitor their investee companies. I become a lot more involved in looking at how the companies are run. And point five, be willing to act collectively with other investors where appropriate, i.e. You know, not act in isolation, but be collectively responsible for making sure that the company is, is run soundly and ethically. Now, those were sort of put in place, we believe, you know, really as a direct response to the 2008 crisis, 
where it was sort of viewed that company or the investors had to take more responsibility to make sure that there wasn't another banking crisis or similar across another sector by getting more engaged with the management of the company itself. What we seem to have had is a bit of sort of a, a law of unintended consequences is that the institutions have looked a lot more closely at, um, at the companies and acknowledged and recognized that as a shareholder, they also have a voice that can be heard and they have a vote that backs that up and what you've seen is a lot of the institutions become a lot more active in the way that they apply both and in how they actually therefore engage with the companies themselves and what you've seen is a lot of these big institutions have been creating their own, own internal corporate governance teams to monitor how the companies are run and by whom. So I think as stewardship codes are, are sort of increasingly incre uh, introduced across the world, you'll see that investors from wherever they come from will become much more active in the way that they look and, and respond to the companies. So looking at the impact of, of corporate governance, um, what we've been sort of seeing is that more and more of the funds have, as you say, been bringing in house corporate governance monitoring um, to the trading floors. So they've been integrating corporate governance teams alongside the portfolio managers. 94% investors, as we said earlier, said they discussed corporate governance issues with other shareholders. And what we think is it's absolutely vital, therefore, for an issuer, for a company, to be fully aware of what the corporate governance policies are of the, the companies or the institutions that are invest in them, to make sure that you, know, you as an issuer are matching the sort of corporate governance policies against your corporate governance standards. If you're not, then obviously they're going to create problems which may materialize at the AGM when they're given the opportunity to vote, or they may become just more vocal in terms of criticism of the company itself and in how they engage in meetings. When you're going out looking at investors, new potential investors, what, what companies are really wanting to do is to make sure that they are meeting potential investors that obviously are interested in the equity story and uh, why they would want to buy the shares, but also the fact that it conforms with the corporate governance policies of the institution. If there is that disconnect or um, they, you could be introducing investors that have a secondary or different motive, you could, as we say here, be letting foxes into their hen house that then may start working with the other investors to affect change within the company itself. So it's increasingly important to know what the policies are of the institution investors, who they're following in terms of guidance, are they looking at the advice from proxy advisors, are they actually getting them to vote for them, or are they uh, actually maintaining their own in-house policies. So if we look at some of the uh, sort of quotes here or, or the comments, um, you know, what we're saying really is that therefore it's increasingly important for, for the companies to communicate with the owners or the shareholders simultaneously, i.e. discuss with the portfolio manager obviously what the equity story is, but also with the heads of corporate governance too. You know, one of the comments that we've heard back from institutions when we're doing the research is that, you know, there, there is sometimes a disconnect or there's there's not a consistent message coming from representatives of the executive board, i.e. when they're talking to the CEO and maybe the CFO and IR, and the conversations they're having with the, the uh, supervisory board when they're talking maybe to the, the chairman and the secretary board or whoever is responsible for corporate governance policy. And if there is sort of daylight and there's maybe disconnects, that, that puts a bit of a red flag up in terms of corporate governance really what they're looking for is that there is consistency in the message here. So what we've been saying is that there, there needs to be more cooperation internally within the, the issuer to make sure that the, the people responsible for the equity investment story are factoring in corporate governance issues when they're putting the story together and also possibly having representations from the sort of supervisory board in the meetings to make sure that any sort of points are covered and there is not a disconnect between the, the stories coming from the company itself. So really, again, what we're saying is it's important to understand how shareholders are going to behave once they become shareholders. Um, we looked at uh, some sort of research or commentary to, to, to 
uh, back this up to see what the institutions are sort of saying themselves. And looking at here with legal in general, the comments they've been making about their view on the stewardship code, it, it's quite clear that they feel as, as an institution investor that they have a duty to be accountable for their clients, you know, as, uh, as they are managing other people's money, to make sure that the people they invest in and themselves maintain the highest corporate governance standards. So they look very closely at their obligations as an investor. And looking here at the research conducted by Aberdeen Asset Management, where they went out to sort of 300 global institutions worldwide, it was you know pretty clear here that most of them consider corporate governance or effective corporate governance to be a critical driver of investment performance. I really what they're saying is that a, a well-run company outperforms a badly run company. So they're looking much more closely at how the companies are running across the whole institutional world. Um, from Aberdeen's point of view, I think one of the key points here is that they look, even at the pre-investment phase, at doing a lot more due diligence that they would have done historically. Um, and the point here that they raise that I think is most interesting is that uh, they, they're not looking at noise. They're looking at the company when they make the investment as if they were actually acquiring the company itself. So the due diligence is a lot more detailed in, in uh, I think we're reading here, in looking not just at the share price performance, but how the company is being run and by whom. So the questions you'd expect would be related to, to that, not just how the company has been performing financially. With Vanguard, um, they made some sort of comments at the back end of last year that I think uh, really sort of focused this. Um, as an indexer, the biggest indexer out there, I think one of the sort of surprising questions is why would an indexer that has to hold the shares, they have no choice in that, actually be concerned with corporate governance? But they clearly are. They have a team of uh, over a dozen people whose only job is to look at the corporate governance policies of the companies they invest in. And they're saying and stating to the market, you know, that they are no longer to be treated as a passive investor, that they are, in fact, to be treated as active. And the reason being is that they have to hold the stock, but, you know, I, I think it suggests that they might not necessarily always like holding the stock. And if they don't like it, then they feel that they to communicate that and, and back that up with their voting power. Um, to make sure that they can influence positively as much as possible how well the companies run. And I think really encapsulating this, the, the, the quote was that for them, good corporate governance supports good returns. And I think it's also worth mentioning that they work closely with other uh, indexes, the biggest other two being BlackRock and State Street. And between them, you know, they carry a lot of clout. They hold over 16% of all U.S. stocks. So you know, if they don't like something and they turn up at the AGM and, and voice that, then that's a, a very powerful voice to be considered. And just looking at some news from earlier on in the year that sort of demonstrates how they've become a lot more active, um, you know, they were very influential in, in making sure that uh, sort of French funds, etc., managed to get board seats with Vivendi's uh, transaction with Telecom Italia. So they were acting actually almost like an activist in the respect of how they were supporting the other funds. Looking at sovereign wealth funds, um, again they're becoming more active. You know, I think everyone is aware that Norges Bank uh, have become a lot more vocal in the way that they look at companies and how they react. I think they they stated this time last year that they. Um, are going to publish their voting intentions ahead of all investor meetings. We believe they hold about 2.5% on average of all U European stocks. So again, that, that sort of them becoming a lot more vocal and responsible in how they invest. Um, looking specifically at some of the news stories with the BBC earlier this year, you know, they stated they're going to crack down on excessive pay. So they're going to wield a, a vote. And uh, as you know, sovereign wealth funds tend to take a pretty particularly large positions and therefore have a, a lot of clout. And sorry, next slide coming through. Sorry, we have a, a technical problem yeah, here. Bear with us, Mark. We'll be there and get to you in a second there. Okay, well I'll just keep talking then <laughs> for the time being. Looking at the, the you slide. Be able to go to the next, you should be able to go to the next slide now, Mark. 
Okay, thank you. Great. Right, Great. super. Okay, so where were we? All right, so just looking at sort of activism, uh, and I'm you know looking at on a broader sense of the world. Uh, we looked at some of the sort of quotes that have been sort of you know, in the press recently, just to sort of reaffirm this. But you know, as a general view, is that activists are becoming a lot more active. Um, they're looking to influence their their shares there's a lot more. Um, as CTM sort of stating there, they're pushing for a change a lot more in European country companies. So 120% increase since 2010, according to Linklater's research. And uh, you know they are sort of coming in uh, and sort of doubling up each year in terms of the activist campaigns that are appearing in Europe. It's probably more than that because we sort of see activist campaigns that start but then sort of maybe finish early and don't make it actually into the public domain as news. So there's probably a lot more activism going on than it is sort of acknowledged by the press for the simple reason that it doesn't become public knowledge. But really what's been sort of driving this is various things which we'll move on to but the the interesting thing is from our point of view is observing how the activists actually get into these situations where they mount an activist campaign in the first place. You know one of the things that have been has been sort of uh, interesting or rather a, a view for us is you know, when a West Coast US activist fund starts uh, an attack on a, a European stock, given that there's sort of 20 odd thousand stocks listed across Europe, how are they getting to identify that opportunity? We know they can't take uh, sort of due diligence on all issuers, so what is it that's sort of driving them towards these opportunities where they can maybe uh, sort of exploit a, a weakness in terms of the, the company itself or its corporate governance? Uh, it, it appears to be invariably because they're being directed towards this by existing shareholders. So shareholders that may uh, sort of be disenfranchised in terms of how they can interact with the company itself, but um, are able to sort of maybe lend stock or, or encourage other investors to come in to act as a, almost like a proxy for them. So just looking at what the uh, sort of activism drivers are, I mean, there's three key areas. There's the economic driver, so you know, looking at making sure that the economic model changes for the company, i.e., you know, how it can perform better, uh, for which they may be looking to put representation on the board to affect that. Clearly, one of the key things areas here is replacement of management if they feel they're underperforming, and obviously releasing capital back to the shareholders as happened with Microsoft. It could be corporate governance driven, so it could be sort of populist or it could be more institutional activism in terms of, sort of looking at the, the sort of board structure and independence and other key areas there. Or the third area really is looking from a legislative point of view, so where you had the Swiss laws being enacted for excessive remuneration. So there's sort of three key areas that drive activism. And these activists then would sort of be taking a position. One of the jobs that we have to do is obviously look at who's moving in and out of uh, issuer clients' shares, which we do through looking at um, who the shareholder base is through the custody accounts that sit on the, the company's share register. As I'm sure the audience is aware that with most share registers, what you see appearing on the register is is not necessarily direct institutional investment, it's investment that's passed through or held on behalf of the shareholder by global custodians, of which you know the primary global custodians being the sort of city banks, state streets of this world. Where we have to look is where the um, activists may appear within those custody accounts. So if we see a long only holder maybe moving from what is sat as a long only position in the plus account suddenly into a minus account, i.e. they're moving their money into stock lending, we clearly want to know where that stock is being lent. Now, because of laws vary from country to country, we may not be able to track that. But if at the same time we see on the share register that certain custodians appear maybe in the top 10 or the top 5, we know that there's possibly certain things happening because the custody activist investors and hedge funds tend to custody their shares through sort of noble, known custodians like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, UBS. So if they suddenly start appearing, that would indicate that um, you know you may need to have a closer look at what's going behind on behind the custody accounts that appear on the register itself. 
So if there does seem to be things happening or there's unusual trading activity or, or things are going on or you're having different conversations, you know, one of the things that companies really need to do is to try and assess the risk to them of things that may be going on. And there's certain key things that the company can do to, to at least identify and, and measure the risk. One of the things is to look at you know, what the percentage of the shareholder base is uh, showing allegiance to different proxy advisory agencies um, and looking at what they're saying about their corporate governance policies and which way they'd recommend votes to go. Then it's looking at uh, the, the voting policies of those proxy advisors in relation to you, but then increasingly looking at what the published pro voting policies are of institutional investors that may not follow the proxy advisors or, or formulate their own policy um, so that you're fully aware really of what support you're getting from your shareholders. This can be done by looking at obviously how shareholders voted at the previous AGM, but then looking forward at in terms of the resolutions you're looking to put forward as to whether they are likely to get support from shareholders or run into dissension or, or revolt or blocks from which point then you can start engaging to, to understand how, uh, how severe that risk may be. So it, again it's looking very much at the shareholders in possibly a different way in terms of how they view your corporate governance standards. And if there is a disconnect, then is to look at how that may be triggering activism or activists who might perceive that as being a weakness in the way that the company is run. So what we try and do as companies is try and help the issuers understand not just who's in the shares and why from the point of investment, but, but how they uh, are going to behave as shareholders in terms of how they perceive the way the company is run. So we, as a company, provide profiles that would sort of categorize whether they follow proxy advisors or they're pure you know, activist in their behavior or they're passive activists, i.e. They, you know, they, they're very active but they don't get too involved, they don't want to seat on the board but they're certainly going to make their voice known or how are they likely to behave, which you would want to do really looking at whichever corporate governance points that would be relevant to you from remuneration to board composition to capital raising to, to whatever it may be that's actually sort of key drivers of your corporate governance policy. If there is a disconnect and uh, the company then has sort of two, two ways to deal with that, they can either sort of change what they're doing in terms of sort of corporate governance policy or, or drop resolutions ahead of AGMs that are clearly not going to be supported or they can go out and engage more closely with the investors to explain their, their um, strategy or what they're trying to do uh, actually needs to be considered even though may, it may be against the stated voting policy of that particular institution. So what we've seen is you know, a significant rise in corporate governance roadshows where companies go out uh, maybe in parallel with their investor roadshows talking to the heads of corporate governance, maybe even in the same meeting at the institutions that are investing them or likely or potential investors in them. So it's just to make sure that you know that if that institution takes corporate governance very seriously that you're addressing the questions that they have and then being able to sort of make sure that they aren't screening you out for things that may be uh, you know, almost like a tick box approach, it's through engagement that you may overcome their uh, strategy. We, we've had a number of corporate governance roadshows this year where big institutions or, or big companies of ours have met with the big institutions here have discussed areas where there's clearly uh, disagreement and invariably that, that conversation means that the institution investor may review their voting policy and may decide to actually uh, abandon the, the guidance they're following and, and tend to vote a separate way or at least the company knows that they're going to, to maybe not get the support from that investor in the way that they may have thought they would have done historically. I put a slide here just with some of the, the sort of steps, but I think it's pretty obvious to most companies here, but a lot of it's about preparation, is looking and identifying what the risk is in terms of the corporate governance issues in exactly the same way that you currently do for your equity investment story. It's looking at whether you're going to have the same support or whether there's going to be sort of further conversations needed. Um, as we said, the corporate governance roadshow is the way that most people are looking to directly engage with the institutional investors. 
and then you have the different stages leading up to the AGM and, and then monitoring how successful that was or how much uh, resistance you did get from the shareholders. And then just looking at what's likely to, to uh, impact this whole process or impact the markets going forward, one of the key things I think is the sort of evolving shareholders' rights directive, which um, is looking to, to encourage companies and investors to engage a lot more. I think what they're saying, really, if you look at the quotes here, is that um, you know it's widely believed that a lot of the problems with the financial crisis was that there was a lot of short-term uh, positions being taken or views being taken by the institutional investors. Um, they were acting more as if they were just renting the stock rather than actually owners of the stock, uh, and therefore weren't really looking at protecting their investment and and sort of engaging with the company in the way that you'd expect as an owner. So it's expected there'll be a lot more monitoring of how the companies will, will actually, um, or the institutions will monitor with the companies. Um, and this is really because the, the research that's coming out here is showing that you know, they believe that suboptimal corporate governance is a problem, that it is going to sort of create problems the way the company is run. And the Clifford Chance comments at the bottom there um, quite clearly state that you know the, the companies have the sort of duty to to engage as, as do the investors there. There's been some sort of key changes too in in terms of the structure of the equity capital markets in terms on on the investment side. Um, a couple of big points really here because it impacts especially Europe is is the impact really recently on the sort of insurance and pensions funds industries. Um, you know, the, for the insurance funds, it's been driven really by Solvency 2, which really sort of was implemented at the beginning of this year. But insurance funds have been uh, gearing up for, for a number of years now, where insurance funds were really being asked to de-risk their portfolios to, to look at providing long-term stability. And equities were obviously being considered to be more of a risky item in terms of the, the structure of the portfolio. And what you've seen is that a lot of insurance funds have been reducing their exposure to equities over the past uh, three, four, five years, which has meant that um, you know, they, they aren't making up quite the same shareholder basis that would have been traditional. And they were, by nature, tend to be longer term, more passive shareholders. So that money's moving away from insurance investors into other hands. What you've seen on the pension fund side is that there's a, a similar um, policy that's coming out, which is IORP2, which relates more to defined benefit pension schemes, but they represent a very big chunk of the European equity market, who are really being sort of asked to the same capital adequacy test as insurance funds, and in terms of risk and who should be looking at it. So. I think there's a general expectation that pension funds too will be reducing their exposure down to equities. So if you are looking at your shareholder base and they're very heavily weighted towards insurance and pension funds, it's going to become a lot more important to understand whether those, those investors are going to likely to be paring down their positions over a period of time and then to discover whose hands those shares are likely to get into whether it moves into sort of uh, wealth management or, or hedge funds will be really down to that particular type of, uh, of issue. But I think the, the point here is that it's expected that the average European issuer's shareholder base could, could start to significantly alter over the next few years. And it would be more and more important for the companies to, to try and uh, command as much as possible or direct as much as possible the investors that will pick up the stock that's coming out into the marketplace especially when you're looking at not introducing people that may have different corporate governance policies to, to you. One of the big ones clearly is MIFID II, um, as investment research is, is already being impacted by this. You know, companies are having to, especially if they're outside the main index, confront the possibility or, or the reality that they are being less covered. Um, there is less out there for the buy side to look at in terms of investment. Corporate access is diminishing as uh, as it becomes impossible for the intermediaries to charge for uh, institutions meeting corporates. 
that that is in turn having providing less money to fuel the investment research side. And I think the expectation is issuers, especially if they're outside the main index, they're going to have to be a lot more responsible for how they engage with the investment community. Uh, they may even have to initiate or pay for research to be carried out on them, and that they will be a lot more responsible for how they engage, i.e. the road shows, the capital markets days, the investor conferences they attend, um, because they won't necessarily be getting the same sort of level of support from, from the broking community. This isn't being implemented till January 2018, but we're certainly seeing the, you know, the impact already in terms of how uh, issuers, smaller they are, that are getting less support and are therefore sort of becoming a lot more uh, required to be responsible for this process themselves. So finally, just really recapping and looking at um, you know, how companies may be reviewing how they engage with the market. What we, we sort of sit down with issuer clients of ours, the first point for all of this is really very much a sort of stock take of finding out where the company sits at the moment. So from an investment point of view, it's looking at who's holding the shares and why they're holding. From a corporate governance point of view, it's looking at how the shareholders supported you in terms of votes at the last AGM, how your corporate governance risk profile appears to the market, and uh, how future issues, i.e. future policies, are going to be received by the investment community. So it's, again, looking at making sure that your policies, corporate governance policies and investor stories are matching the investors and your target investors. And um, the targeting programs you put together factor in also corporate governance when going out to meet with investors. There's no point sitting down in front of an investor that's going to screen you out because your chairman and the CEO is the same person. Uh, it would be best directing yourself towards institutions that are not concerned with that. When you're uh, positioning the company, therefore, the story would it, be evolving to include corporate governance, and then the engagement process itself would still continue to have the, the traditional IR roadshows, but also maybe with investor corporate governance meetings held at the same time. And then the process of monitoring it and evaluating how things have gone looks also at uh, you know, how the, the votes are being wielded by those investors. So I think I've sort of covered most of the key points there, um, Bob. I don't know if there's any questions that yeah, you Mark, want to yeah. add to Sorry. Mark, hi. Yes. First of all, I want to just thank you for a very insightful and eye-opening update on uh, corporate governance uh, involvement in the institutional investor decision-making process. It was uh, very, very informative. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So one, one question uh, I have from, from CMI to I's experience, uh, do you see when issuers, when they go out on their, on their road shows, um, meeting with their institutional investors, current and prospective, do you see them actually uh, setting up in parallel meetings with the uh, institutional investors and the, or the portfolio managers as well as the corporate governance experts. I know you mentioned that Vanguard, for example, there are several uh, people involved that all they do is corporate governance. So I think I'm, you know, that'd be helpful to see what your experience is there. Yeah, certainly. So what, what we've seen is that, you know, invest, companies still going out obviously into the market, especially in the UK, working with corporate brokers or, you know, investment banks with adopting the corporate broking role. They're putting the investor meetings together. And what we're finding is that the issuer clients of ours from all over the world are saying, you know, whilst we are meeting the portfolio manager at Fidelity or whoever it is, can it, we arrange to meet, have a parallel court meeting with the whoever's uh -huh. responsible for corporate governance at that institution? So they may separate, sit as separate meetings, or increasingly, actually, what you're seeing is that you have representation from both sides in the same meeting. And that the impact there is that you need to have representation from both parts from the issuer itself. So it could be the IR person representing the interests of the sort of executive right. board or executive committee, but maybe also the secretary board on the supervisory side, because the questions are going to blend in, and there's a sort of more of a gray area as to which direction they're going to go. So to give you some sort of indication of scale, what we've seen is a six-fold increase in the request for corporate governance roadshows from our clients in the past 12 months. So you know wow. this is a fairly new 
phenomena, but it's, I think, being driven by the way that the institutions are looking very differently at the companies they invest in. You know, it's not all about share price performance. It is about how the companies have run and how sustainable the story is and who's running the company. So I think you're going to see more and more of this engagement. And when we're seeing issues that are not prepared for that, they can run into to problems that may mean that if the institution is not getting the information that they're expecting, they may even screen out that in, uh, company as an investment. Well, they may still invest, but they may sort of minimize their exposure until the uh, corporate governance is right. And, and even within institutions, you know, you, you could have a corporate governance head that says, look, as you currently uh, conduct your corporate governance standards, we have one or two funds that can invest in you, but were you to adjust your corporate governance standards to be more in line with international best practice, we have another five or six or seven funds that could also take a position. And it, I think the onus then is much, yeah, much more for the companies to understand really what the corporate governance drivers are for that institution, because they vary from institution to institution. More and more of them are bringing this policy making in-house. They may still look at proxy advisors' guidance, but they may choose to ignore it. So you know that is only going to be discovered through direct engagement. Uh, you know, as I say, what you're seeing, I believe, is that the institutional investor is realizing they have a lot more, not just responsibility, but a lot more power as investor to, to influence the way the companies are being run. You know, as Vanguard is sort of saying there, I think with their, their vote is that, you know, they might not like, you know, they might have to hold you, but they might not like holding you, so they, they may try and do something about that. Right. So one, just a related question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, with the de decision-making process actually on the trading desk itself, does corporate uh, at the different uh, institutional investors, do they get involved in the investment decision right at the trading desk? Yeah, well, they, they increasingly they appear to be. Now, we've spoken to lots of different institutions to try and gauge what the process is within the institution itself. What you're seeing is that more and more of them are taking the corporate governance team maybe out of the sort of basement or, you know, in a separate office and integrating them actually into the, the investment desks. Whether they have the power to uh, overrule investments I think is questionable, but they clearly, you know, raise this as an issue if they feel that there is sort of, uh, you know, corporate governance problems or, or um, you know, reasons why the company should sort of think twice about its exposure. And for what it appears that, you know, there seems to be a sort of a process that is followed, that if there is a discrepancy or a difference of opinion, shall we say, between the portfolio manager and whoever is monitoring the corporate governance, this may be then escalated up to the head of the desk or it may then carry on up to, you know, the, the chief investment officer to actually sort of make a decision. I don't think it necessarily leads to a, a company not investing, but it may be that they, you know, reduce their exposure so they stay as an underweight position, or they might divest a bit of the, the holding they've got to make sure that their exposure is minimized as this is sorted out. And if it isn't sorted, then, you know, it may be that they start exiting the stock altogether. You know, our job would be to track that. But, um, you know, what we are seeing is that you know, there seems to be sort of policies. There are certain things that are prohibited with certain funds. You know, they will not invest in certain types of company. And it's not the obvious. It's not those ones that employ child labor or armaments or tobacco, whatever it is. It could be much more fundamental. It could be about how the yeah. company raises capital or board composition or uh, non-independence of the board is a hot topic. So, you know, there's a lot of other points that may heavily influence whether a, a position is taken or how big that position will be. Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the again for the very uh, informative update uh, on the corporate governance approach. We really appreciate it. Uh, for the listeners, you see Mark's contact information is there. Feel free to reach directly out to him or to me. My contact information there as well. I'd like to thank those attendees. And once again, Mark, we appreciate the update. And at this point, I will end the webinar. Thanks to all. Bob, Bob, can I just chuck in one last thing? Thank you very much to the audience for yes, attending. Sure. If anyone Absolutely. wants, if anyone wants to receive the full corporate governance survey, um, if they let you, you know, Bob, we'll forward that electronically to them. 
So we, we can provide that full survey. Okay. Yes, we, we'd be delighted to do that. Okay, thanks again, and, and uh, have a good uh, afternoon, all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.